Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. And in today's video, we are going to be continuing Kill a Kill, The Web of Life, What Aspire Gwen Was in Kill a Kill, Part 5. As always, if you're new to the channel or if you're a regular and like what we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. So, where we last left off with our series, we had the finalists of the Ho Jean Academy Natural Selection. That being Gwen, Ryuko, Mako, Hobi, and their new ally, this world's version of Matt Murdock, aka Daredevil, aka the Kingpin. And for some of you who are not aware, in the Spider Gwen universe, Matt Murdock becomes the Kingpin. So since we're using the more Spider Gwen mythos in this saga, I decided to incorporate that into the story. Now, another thing I uh, want you guys to be aware of is that while this video is being uploaded to you all, I am currently asleep because I recorded this video ahead of time because, as you know, the 4th of July, where I'm from in the United States, it's a federal holiday, so that means I'm off of work and I am sound asleep. But all the same, I do hope you will enjoy today's story, so as always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hobie stepped into the arena as he came face to face with Ira Gamaguri, head of the disciplinary committee and member of the Elite Five. This is your last chance now, Runt. You can learn your place, bow and apologize before Lady Satsuki, and you can be gone from our sight, or you can stand and face the consequences. Hmm. You really think I'm afraid of you, love? I'm about to get a date with the hottest girl on campus. <laughs> Do your worst. Hobie would emit the life fiber webbing all around his body, transforming into the spider punk uniform that he so often wore. While Ira, in the meantime, would use his Goku uniform to transform into a different state. The first level of his Goku uniform, Shackle Regalia. Hobie would be confused by this. He didn't really have any arms that were showing and instead he seemed to be wrapped in, in one place. Is this some kind of joke? I mean, what, you're not gonna fight back? Your power is dressing up like an ugly mummy? Hmm. If you're so confident, then why don't you show me the extent of your power? Don't say I didn't warn you. Hobie would take no wasted motion as he rushed towards the now restrained Ira, beating and pummeling him with every ounce of his strength. Ira didn't move. He didn't seem to stop, nor did he seem to impede Hobie's movements at all. To everyone watching on with no weird way of understanding what was happening, you would think that Ira's power was virtually useless and that he had just confined himself to the fate of being Hobie's punching bag. And Hobie wasn't wasting any time. He threw every punch and kick he possibly could, picking up the encased individual and slamming him down to the ground with extensive force putting all of his enhanced strength into his attacks. While Gwen, Ryuko, and Mako were cheering for Hobie, believing that he was going to have this in the bag, Matthew, on the other hand, was starting to have a worried feeling as he spoke to his own Kamui 
that being prime cats, commonly of the beast. You're seeing this, right, prime cats? I am. I believe their friend is more foolish than they realize if they aren't able to see the truth. In the meantime, the other members of the Elite Five, along with Lei Satsuki, who continued to watch, with an impressed smile on her face. The boy definitely has stamina, Satsuki would say. I'll give him that. But still, Olivia would say, if he hasn't realized what's happening now, then he's in for a rude awakening. Yes, that is a shame. All that power, all that strength going to waste. When Ira blooms into his second form, I'm afraid our spider is going to be in for a rude awakening. I hope he can survive the onslaught, although I wouldn't put much faith in it. The longer this beatdown continued to drag, the more and more everyone started to get just a bit concerned. Why weren't they calling for the match? The fight should be over. Ryuko would be the first one to voice her opinions. Hey, come on, the match is over. Your friend isn't even fighting back. At this rate, he's gonna get his head spiked into the ground so many times, he's gonna end up being planted into the center of the earth. <laughs> I wouldn't be so worried about my friend if I were you, Satsuki would say. I'd be more concerned for your friend. Almost as if on cue, as Hobie backed away, as he started to pant in exhaustion, Ira would stand to his feet. Thank you for giving me the boost that I need. I didn't even have to impose my own self-charge. I must say, the power you display is truly remarkable. And now, I'll have the grand pleasure of giving it back to you. Full force. Now, transform. Scourge Regalia. Ira's uniform would transform once again. Changing from the defensive state into now a more offensive flurry. He had transformed his suit into the Scourge Regalia. The densely plated armor, now fueled and powered by all of the kinetic energy that was given to it thanks to all of those super enhanced strikes from Hobie, was now fully charged and ready to go. Hobie didn't have a chance to fully understand the full weight of his air as Ira would now loom over him. And Hobie, he didn't have the full stamina and strength to react with all of his might. The best he could do was run and dodge, Ira being able to use his spikes to rip through his webbing that he shot towards him, slamming Hobie and throwing him around like a rag doll. Safe to say, the tide of the battle had now turned in favor of Gamagori, and Hobie found himself fighting for his life. The looks on all of Hobie's friends' faces was that of complete shock and disbelief. How could they have not seen this coming? How could something like this even be possible? But at the same time, it wasn't as if this wasn't something that couldn't have been predicted. And it was just how Matthew feared. It wouldn't have just been for nothing that he stood there and took all of those attacks. He had to have been planning something like this. He waited till Hobie used up all of his strength, just feeding him nothing but energy with every blow he was able to strike upon him to fuel his own Goku uniform. And now he's turned it from its defensive state to its offense. Hobie wouldn't have much options in terms of having a place to run as there was no weakness to the Scourge Regalia. There was nowhere for him to truly strike, and even still, it was fueled by the energy that he gave it. 
In the end, he couldn't slow down Ira, no matter what he did. Those spikes on the uniform were definitely starting to dig a little deep, as Hobie started not only feeling the battering and the bruising, but the many cuts and the many stab wounds that were marking all over his body. Hobie found himself shaking on two legs, not sure how long he could stand. <sighs> well, <laughs> you're pretty strong. But then again, it makes sense. After all, you're using my power. So it's only natural that you'd be this strong. Because it's not like you actually have the strength to beat me yourself. <laughs> you think I'd fall for such an obvious taunt? No. This is called strategy. If you were stupid enough to fuel my suit with your own energy, then that means that you are foolish enough to face the full weight of your consequences. <clears throat> Hobie would be kicked in the gut as he fell to the ground. You know, I haven't liked you since the day you stepped foot on my campus. The way you speak so bold and brashly, even your friends have a little more decorum. But what really pisses me off is how you talk to Lady Satsuki. You act as if you have the right to even be in her presence, as if you even have the right to breathe the same air as her. You're nothing but filth, swine, the lowest of the low. You come from the common denominator of the masses. And those who come from such low standings should have their heads to the ground and be grateful that they're allowed to draw from the same breath as her majesty. You're done talking because at this point, you're just going to fill the air with a lot of carbon dioxide because damn, you blow a lot of hot breath. <clears throat> Another punch to the gut sent him reeling back as well. With Hobie running on fumes and nothing but his will, his guts, and a guitar in his hand. Hobie clutched his guitar as he stood, Ira walking to him menacingly. You know... If it would be so kind, allow me just this one favor. <laughs> and what might that be? I wrote a song for her lordship up there. And if you would do me the honor before you finish me off, I would at least like to show my gratitude if you would allow me to play this song. Ira would look to Lady Satsuki. She would nod in approval. Very well. Play your song. <laughs> Thank you, my good sir. Hobie would take the strings out of his guitar, replacing them with his webbing life fibers. As he took his pick, he took a deep breath. As he pointed the base of his guitar, Directly towards Gamagori. I dedicate this to Lady Satsuki. Truly the light of my life. I like to call this little number. The Counter. Hobie would begin to play his guitar. The melody at first being slow and steady. But it would surely begin to pick up speed. And so too would the sound waves, the sound waves growing stronger and stronger. It was a melody that was unique, but at the same time, it was one that could rock to the very core. The sound waves started to grow denser and denser with each strum, with each pick, a shock wave would echo through the arena. Another shock wave that shot directly towards Gamagori. 
Gamagori could feel his head starting to throb. This was no ordinary music. What What was he... Hmm. Starting to figure it out? Yeah. I can't beat you with physical attacks. You've sapped up almost all of my energy. But... There's one thing I can do. One thing that... I was always good at. You know the funny thing about sound? You can't see it. It's nothing but invisible air. But you know the one thing about sound? It can affect the soul, my friend. With a hard strum, multiple sound waves would be shot towards Gamagori as he fell to one knee. What the? My head! <laughs> Your body, no matter how powerful you make it, can't fight against sound. Another shockwave would be hit towards him. You can drum up as much armor as you want, but my music will still reach you. The spirit of rock and roll. That is what I live by. It's how I live my life. It's something that not you, not this damn academy, not even my own pops could ever take away from me. It was something that my mom gave to me. Something that I carry with me my whole life. And because of that, as long as I have the spirit of rock and roll, I will never back down to you. I will never kneel I won't get on my hands and feet. But I'll tell you what you're going to do, Mr. Gamagori. He would strum more sound waves that continued to beat down onto the larger individual. The sound waves being so strong, they caused massive craters to be formed. The shock waves beating into the armor of Gamagori, destroying it piece by piece. Until eventually, Gamagori, his Goku uniform had been pushed to its limits. The life fibers all but destroyed. The armor would resuscitate and Gamagori would be left in his humanoid form. Gamagori would collapse to one knee as he looked up to Hobi. Hobi would take both his hands grasping both sides of Gamagori's face. Reeling his head back, he would now issue what he called the grand finale, or as he would like to call it, the broom-hilled headbutt from hell. Why was it called this? Because like Broomhild, the show ends when she sings. With a loud thud, both of the skulls would collide. Ira's eyes would roll back into his head, nothing but the white showing as the large man collapsed to the ground. Hobie then turned to the people as he strummed his guitar to his back and took a bow. The crowds would begin to cheer. They were starting to become electric, unglued. They had never seen anything like this before. The head of the disciplinary committee, they had actually managed to take him down. Hobie would wobble back to his teammates who were all worried sick about him, especially Gwen, who would chastise him for doing that stupid headbutt If he kept doing that, he was going to lose all his brain cells. Even still, Matthew would even give him praise as well. You were able to use sound. That's impressive. Yeah, although I figure for you, that probably did a number on your eardrums. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no worries. I was able to plug in some earplugs just in time. But still... I'll have to be careful if I ever tangle with you. 
Nao Uzu Sanagayama and Ira Gamagori were both taken down. The last three members of the Elite Five, they were not too thrilled with this outcome. The next match was set to begin as Gwen Stacy would take her stage in the arena. But who was going to be her opponent? Well, a woman with her hair tied back in an afro bun, wearing round circular glasses, would approach. Hmm. Looks like I'm going to be your opponent. Name's Olivia. Olivia Octavius. But my friends call me Liv. So, what's your play? Oh, nothing, really. I'm not like the meatheads. You see, I believe in fact. I believe in science and in logic. And I have been waiting a long time to get with one of you. I really want to study that bump on the back of your neck to understand how you're able to produce these web-like life fibers. They're truly something else. Four tentacle-like arms would protrude from her back. I'm going to enjoy dissecting you, even if it means I have to peel the flesh off your bones. If you think you can do it, then you're more than welcome to try. In the world of science, I don't try, I do. Getting results is the name of the game. Now, shall we conduct the experiment, Miss Stacy? This concludes Kill a Kill, The Web of Life. What inspired Gwen was in Kill a Kill, Part 5. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications. Also, stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we continue. Spy X Family Project Web. What if Lloyd Forger was Spider-Man Noir? Season 1, Part 5. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.